Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious word of sovereign grace. Here's this week's message. Appreciate the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I had a, a few reservations about whether or not that we should hold services this morning, but uh, I, I think that it's the right thing to do if the roads are passable and and they are, and uh, I'm thankful that everyone got here safe. Um, and this is the day, just like every other day that the Lord has made. Uh, we should be glad and rejoice in it. We have a lot to be thankful for. I was just thinking as I stood up about the songs that we sing and the purpose of the singing of, of these hymns that we have it's a, it's a good thing, I believe, that I know that through the week, uh, normally I wake up with one of these songs on my heart, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, there have been times of, especially since I, I tried to mention talking about rock and roll a few weeks ago, there, I think the devil's tempted me a little bit, and I'm waking up with one or two of those songs, and I very quickly rebuke those things. Um, but, but I think that what the Lord gives us um, to sing and make melody in our hearts and sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord, the method that we have in the New Testament, is, I believe, is a cappella. Uh, they're, they're, the New Testament is completely silent about using any musical instruments. Yes, and I, I'm well aware that the Old Testament has a lot to say about musical instruments. They have their place in the law. But I don't believe that we have a right to cherry pick what parts of the of the Old Testament law service that we would want to bring or interject into the New Testament church. And a lot of people have chosen to cherry pick uh, the musical instruments. Those things we understand the Old Testament was in types and shadows of that which is to come. They were uh, uh, they were they were figures of the the service of the inward service that God gives us in the New Testament. All those things that they did in the Old Testament where they said the, the carnal ordinances and the divers or the diverse or various washings that they did and all those sacrifices pointed to one thing or one person and that's the ultimate sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and that's what all of those things pointed to. And so those musical instruments which were outward, uh, they had their place. And now we, we sing from the heart. Remember, that's where the Lord's looking. The, when, when the Lord was looking for a king uh, over, uh, over Israel after Saul had been rejected, uh, there's a lot that could be said about that, about Saul, King Saul. But nonetheless, the Lord rejected Saul and he sought a king. Uh, and after all of Jesse's sons were brought before Samuel, uh, the, the lesson comes out that God has rejected these because God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God, God looks on the heart. And so if we sing with grace in our hearts, uh, we sing these songs and, and we spend about 30 minutes in preparation to help us. At least it helps me to forget about all the things that may have taken place in the car ride. Sometimes there's... We have some very interesting discussions sometimes on the way to church, believe it or not. I don't know if that ever happens to anybody else. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it puts our souls in frames, as one of the songs says. It helps us to forget about the things of the world, and we start to begin to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we worship Him in, in song and in praise. So, And, and the, the amazing thing is that this gift, or, or this gold, golden heart, I'm going to call it, that God gives each and every one of you. It doesn't matter uh, if you think that if you think that you can carry a tune in a bucket or not, or if you can carry a tune in a wheelbarrow or you know, however big or however small. 
the Lord's not interested in, in that. The Lord, if you're making the melody in your heart and you're singing with grace in your hearts, that is what God is in tune with, and that's what God cares about. And I, I know that I love to be in, in, in a large assembly where there are people that that have a gift to be able to sing audibly, uh, and it's very it's very edifying, but. The bottom line is the Lord doesn't care about that. Uh, it's edifying for us and it's uplifting for us, but the Lord is looking on the heart. So um, we have a lot of matters of the heart that we have to consider throughout this life. I was thinking this morning about that, that text in the book of Revelation that says that God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Well, you know, there, there's coming a time... Well, that indicates to me that if there's a situation that causes a tear, uh, if it's in heaven, it's going to be a tear of joy. It's not going to be a tear of sorrow. Uh, David in one place talked about that his if his tears were put in a bottle, and that God would remember or, or look upon the sorrows and, and the, uh, the trials and the tribulations of David. And, uh, but you know... If our tears were put in a bottle, God knows every tear that we've ever shed, and and uh, tears of sorrow. And you know there have been some some times in my life, and I trust in yours also that you've had some tears of joy, and thank God for those. But in heaven and immortal glory, I don't believe that an occasion will ever arise for a tear of sorrow to be wiped away from our eyes. But even here, when we have those, we can trust that we have the closeness of the fellowship with the Lord, that He can wipe away those tears, whether it be through the loss of we're mourning on, on account of the loss of a loved one, a child, or a parent, or a grandparent, or, or something of that nature. The Lord knows how to comfort those uh, that, that go through such. He, he says in one place, and I know that this has... Uh, more than one application. He says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, I know that if we are mourning on account of loss of a loved one, a parent, a child, or whatever, that God can comfort. But I think more specifically that's speaking to those that are mourning on account of their sin. Uh, I, I believe that there's a text, uh, I may have mentioned it briefly last week, about the woman that was washing Jesus' feet with her hair, with her tears, and wiping his feet with her hair. And it was told Peter that, uh, or Peter was asked, who, who do you think would love the one, love the most, the one that was forgiven a little bit or the one that was forgiven a lot? And, of course, the answer was that woman was loving much because she was forgiven much. And, and I think that sometimes uh, I run across people that, that probably don't have a sense that they've, that they've really even sinned against God because they don't love very much, uh, and, it's, and that's an evidence that they've not been forgiven very much. I believe that if God forgives our sin, that's a very great thing that for us to contemplate and understand. If He puts our sin away as far as the east is from the west, He's forgiven us much. And therefore, we should love Him much. And that, that love should be evidence in how we serve one another and how we treat one another. <clears throat> but, but anyway, that's another subject in itself. Uh, but this woman loved much because she was forgiven much. And she anointed the Lord. Uh, we, we know that that's, that was for His burying that was going to take place and so on. And that uh, she indeed did wash his feet with her tears. So well, let's ask ourselves the question, how much do we love the Lord? Uh, and it, it's probably directly uh, related with how much we recognize that we've been forgiven. Uh, I know that, <clears throat> that sometimes it's, uh, it seems laborious to talk about the depravity of man. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that's who we are in a state of nature is we're dead in trespasses and sins because of the sin of Adam. Uh, the Lord told Adam in the day that you eat thereof ye shall surely die. And I don't believe that Adam died a spiritual death. Adam never did get to partake of the tree of life. Uh, the, actually the Lord drove Adam and Eve out of the garden to prevent that very thing. 
He says, lest he put forth his hand and eat also of the tree of life and live forever. So that was the mercy of God uh, to drive, have driven man out of the garden to keep him from eating in, in, in the state that he was in. But I don't believe that Adam and Eve had spiritual life. They had a, uh, they had a natural life that would, they could fellowship with God, but it wasn't a, a, on a spiritual level. But they fell and they died to the fellowship of God. Uh, they immediately died. That now, and then the workings of sin <clears throat> it was not until 930 years later that Adam died. <laughs> you think about living that long. Um, in the current world that we're in, I could not see myself living to be 900 plus years. Um, it, it just kind of boggles the mind to think about it. But... That was the case before the flood, and uh, I know I'm kind of all over uh, this morning, but just bear with me. And one of the things I think that we see there that there was a very um, there was a very oxygen rich environment before. Remember when the Lord created the heaven and the earth, and He put that canopy of water above the earth. So what you have there is a lot of this ultraviolet rays coming from the sun being blocked, and then. We know that it never even rained until the time of Noah. Uh, the way that the Lord watered the, the plants and everything, a dew came up from the earth. So you, you've got a very different environment. Uh, and some say it was uh, much richer in oxygen. So in that, then, then the question comes up, how did they deal with fire and all that? I, I, I really don't know. But uh, they, one of the things that we do know is that you didn't have the ultraviolet rays from the sun because of that canopy of water that was released during the flood. Uh, that, that made a big difference, I believe. But anyway, and their diet and the things that they ate. <laughs> so I was talking again with someone the other day. Um, and they were, we were discussing the, uh, the things that we eat. And I said, well... You almost have to be a doctor of pharmacology to understand the things that they're putting in the foods. If you look at some, for the sake of, you know, shelf life. So um, uh, I think sometimes maybe we just need to let that fall by the wayside and buy something fresh and eat it rather than, well, hey, I can buy this and uh, they put this stuff in it. And now it'll last uh, uh, 200 years. Or what did they say about it? Twinkies, and they say that Twinkies could survive a nuclear blast or something like that. But any, nonetheless, the things that they're being put in our food were not the same things that they were eating back in those days. So the conditions were different, and they could have lived a long time. Um, the, the scripture talks about Methuselah; that he was the one that lived the longest, 969 years old. But when the Lord declared that He was going to destroy the earth by a flood, He said that the number of man's days would be 120 years. And that's now that that canopy is no longer there to protect the ultraviolet rays, dietary things have changed. Um, and then we do a lot to shoot ourselves in the foot from the things that we eat. Now, I'm not advocating that you should go back to the Old Testament and just find only the clean animals and only eat that. I think that we have more information in the New Testament that tells us that every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. So everything that God has given us is good to eat. The problem is that we we need to learn to control. And I don't want to meddle or anything because I have this problem myself. A lot of times it's not what we eat, it's how much we eat. So, But anyway, uh, Adam and Eve actually, um, they fell in the garden. And I don't believe that Adam died a spiritual death. I hear even some old Baptist preachers say that. And I don't think they've really studied that out. Uh, if Adam would have had eternal life, he couldn't have lost it. And that's the reason the Lord calls it eternal life. It's because it's eternal. Uh, but Adam never did get to eat of that tree. He drove man from the garden. He said he put a flaming sword and cherubims that turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And what those cherubims were, those are angels. Those were special angels that were there to protect that, that entrance into that garden. <clears throat> 
I hear some say, well, you know, uh, we need to go over there and find the Garden of Eden because uh, uh, the land of Havilah is over there. And it says, and the gold was good over there. And, and they say, well, the Euphrates River, that's one of the rivers that snake. But hey, I want you to think about this for a minute. If you have a cataclysmic flood, like I think that the Scripture says, I can't remember how many cubits above the tops of the mountains this thing was, it changed the course of every river. There was so much earth and everything that was moved during that flood. You're not going to find the Garden of Eden. <laughs> You're not going to find... That, that yes, even though there is a Euphrates River in Iraq today, it's not the same one. The courses have all changed. God's keeping the way. If there is a special place on this earth uh, that uh, that did not get wiped out, I don't know about it, but I, I trust that everything got wiped out in the flood and everything changed. <clears throat> so a- Adam and Eve died. They died a uh, death to the fellowship of God. They were driven from the garden, and that's one of the one of the things that makes an interesting study. You look at the Word of God, you see where it talks about the Lord leading His children, as a shepherd leads his sheep, and you read about the places where God drives man, like you know, like the Lord ran the money changers out of the temple; He was driving them out. It's a very interesting study to see the differences when the Lord drives and when the Lord leads. Brothers and sisters, trust me, you want the Lord leading you. You do not want the Lord driving you. You want the Lord leading you. And we do need to follow softly on after the Lord. Uh, We need to heed His commands and His precepts for our own good. So, man died in the garden, uh, and everyone that's been born after that, uh, Abel and Cain, uh, they were born sinners. And then we know that, um, that sin is passed on through the Father. Uh, and this is how that we know that the Lord Jesus Christ, who, because He was born of a virgin, that holy thing that was born in Him was of the Holy Ghost. Now, and the Scripture actually refers to that holy thing. Now, I'm not, just, I'm not being disrespectful, but the, uh, God spoke life in the womb of Mary, and uh, she never knew a man. And so there was no sin that was passed on uh, when she was impregnated by the Holy Ghost. And it is not as uh, some of our friends in other camps would say that the Lord actually came down and had relations with Mary like you and I do. That is not the case. It says that the Holy Ghost would overshadow her. Uh, the Holy Ghost would overshadow her, not, not some man. Uh, but anyway, that's, I believe that's kind of, of, of a perversion. That makes it not a virgin birth when you actually uh, think about doing it the natural way. That's not a virgin birth. Uh, and I know that it's... Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, the sin is passed by the Father, down by the Father. And that's how all, every one of us were born into this world uh, in sin. Separated from God, separated from the fellowship of God. We're not reconciled to God uh, because of the sin that we have in our lives. And because of that sin, we're each and every one of us worthy of the wrath of God. But we know that our God is merciful that He's delivered us. So we're born into this world, and the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, there's only, a, there's only one exception that I can think of of anyone that was ever born, or that were told about, or anyone that was born in this world that was born of the Spirit of God, or that was born again. Now, that's the, the reason that we need to be born again was because of the fact that we were born into this world dead in trespasses and sins. And that's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And that word quickened means made alive. Okay, uh, remember God is the judge of the quick and the dead. That means God's the judge of the living and the dead. So, um, so the necessity to be born again was because we're born in this world. We're totally separated from God, and we're according to Ephesians two chapter or chapter two verses one and two. 
we're walking according to the course of this world and we are by nature children of wrath even as others. So if God had left us uh, in our fallen state, we would be suffering the wrath of God. But we, we know that that's not the case with us as the Lord has uh, very graciously and mercifully chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We hear all the time uh, by, our, by our friends and other denominations that we must accept Christ in order to be born again. But I want to tell you that's a biblical impossibility because men that are dead in trespasses and sins will not accept the things of God. I want to read... Uh, uh, I know this is uh, some things that most of us already know or we should know, but 1 Corinthians chapter 2, let's look at some things. And remember, a few weeks ago I started over here to show you that that the, uh, the foundation of the Apostle Paul's preaching was to be Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This is to be central. And, and the fact of the matter, if the Lord had not died and uh, uh, had bled, suffered, and died on the cross, and had He not uh, come out of the grave and been risen for our justification, we would have no hope. But because we were chosen Christ before, before the foundation of the world, these are the ones that the Lord died for. Now, very quickly, John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now, in that same chapter, uh, when it, it talks about that it was winter and Jesus was at the Feast of Dedication, and some Pharisees came to him and says, How long do you make us to doubt? Tell us plainly if you're the Christ. He said, I told you, and you believe not because you're not of my sheep. Okay, now, <laughs> what uh, logic, I mean, a five-year-old could figure this out. If Jesus died for the sheep, and Jesus tells some that you're not my sheep, then Jesus did not die for these. Uh, the same ones that Jesus died for, I believe that He prayed for in John chapter 17. Uh, the Lord In the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17, notice I did not say Matthew 5 or 6, the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17, the Lord said, I pray for these that Thou have given me, for they are Thine. I pray not for the world. If if Jesus had died for all the world without exception, He definitely would be praying for them. But He says He prays for those that were given to Him by God the Father. John chapter 17. Uh, I, I recommend that you read it. Uh, so over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we we'd asked ourselves the question, can a man that's dead in trespasses and sins accept Christ as his Lord and Savior? Uh, I'm going to tell you emphatically, no, that it's an impossibility. Uh, because until a man is born of the Spirit, he cannot discern the things of the Spirit. Uh, Nicodemus said in John chapter 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That means he can't perceive it. And, and, and unless a man be born again, uh, uh, born of the water and of Spirit, he cannot enter into it. So you have to be born of, of the. Uh, you have to be born again in order to see it. And to enter into it. And the kingdom of God is something that we can enter into now, brothers and sisters. It, yes, it's future and it's third phase. Uh, third phase, we have the first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven where Paul went and saw things that were not lawful to utter. But we can enter in uh, to the kingdom of God now. He says, The law and the prophets were until John, and since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. You can't press into it if it doesn't exist. Well, it exists, and it's the church, and the nature of it is spiritual. That's why you had to be born of the Spirit of God in order to see it or perceive it. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, this is something that should be very familiar to all of us. And let's start down here about verse, verse 6. He says, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that have come to naught. Uh, another place you find that God declares the wisdom of the world to be foolishness. Okay, He says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, 
even the hidden wisdom which God had ordained before the world to our glory. There it is again. He's talking about before the world began. God did some choosing. He says, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If those people that were that were nailing the, the nails or, or that had judged the Lord and that were nailing the nails on the, to place Him on the cross, had they known the things that we understand and know, they wouldn't have crucified Him. Uh, that's because they didn't have ears to hear, didn't have eyes to see. Remember the Lord says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Everybody has a pair of these. Uh, mine don't work as good as they used to. Uh, I, I think I've got tinnitus, uh, if ten tinnitus or tinnitus or whatever it is. I have a continual ringing in my ears, and they tell me that the frequencies, uh, certain frequencies, are burning out, and that's what that ringing is that I hear. Uh, well, everybody is born, and most everybody is born with the capability of hearing audibly the things that are going on around us. For our for our benefit, you know, and our safety, if, I, I, if there's a train racing at me, if I don't feel the vibration of it, I can hear, hopefully I can hear that train coming and I can get out of the way. But what uh, uh, some folks fail to understand is when the Lord is talking, He's not talking to the natural ears. He's talking to those that have, believe it or not, and the Scripture talks about having ears that are circumcised. Ears that have... The, 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 the things of nature cut away uh, to allow us to uh, take in and understand the, the spiritual things of God. So, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. So now, we, we understand that uh, by nature, uh, in Adam's children, we have a natural body that's dead in trespasses and sins. It, and, and in that state, he says... The carnal mind is enmity with God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's the mind that we have in a state of nature. It's carnal and it's at enmity with God. And a man in such a state will not follow after God. And God doesn't want it anyway because God Himself is at enmity with the natural or the carnal mind. So we have to be given a new mind. Remember a couple of weeks ago we said we talked about let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And that we're to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Okay, according to Romans chapter 12. So God is not interested in the carnal in, in uh, ser- serving, being served with the carnal mind because it's at enmity with Him. It's totally contrary to His laws. Uh, verse... Eight, he says, um, which one, none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But as God, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Right there, he's very plainly saying, a man that's in a state of nature cannot know the things of the Spirit of God. And brothers and sisters, to have fellowship with God, he says, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. To have fellowship with God, it has to be in spirit. And a natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. He can't, he can't see them. He can't hear them. They haven't entered into his heart, but God reveals them by his Spirit. So we see the nature of the kingdom now is not a natural kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. The, uh, the Jews actually struggle with this when they ask... The Lord said, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom unto Israel? And he says, It's not for you to know the times or the season which the Father hath in his own power. Uh, they misunderstood the nature of the kingdom. The kingdom is in the world, but the kingdom is not of the world, is the way that the Word of God explains it to us. 
The kingdom is in the world, but it's not of the world. And you know what? He's at the end of time, uh, on the morning of the resurrection, the kingdom is going back up to God. It's the same kingdom that the Apostle John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth uh, and coming down from God out of heaven as a, a bride adorned for her husband. That's the church, the new Jerusalem. That's the kingdom of God whereby that we can enter in today and we can have fellowship with God. And remember he, he said in one place in the book of Romans, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And we can experience that fellowship with God today and we can press into the kingdom of God. And within the kingdom of... I want you to notice something. Uh, what, what does the word kingdom mean? It means a king's dominion. Uh, there is a king. He is alive. He is the king of kings and the lord of lords and he has dominion and I'm not going to be like some of uh, those Pharisees did and I hope that you're not uh, those that said we will not have this man to rule over us you remember when the Pharisees said that uh, but I, I pray I, I want to yield to the Holy Spirit I want to yield my members as servants of righteousness where in times past I used this body for all the wrong things and for all the wrong reasons I wasn't serving God but now we need to yield our members as servants of righteousness. And that's over in the, uh, the book of Romans, chapter 6 or 7, I believe. But God has revealed the things that He's prepared for us and revealed them to us by His Spirit. That's why we have a hope and anticipation and expectation to someday to live in heaven in a world of glory. It's not because I told you about it and it's not because your mom or daddy told you about it. It's because the Lord told you about it. He planted that hope within your heart. Uh, or within, well, I'm not talking about the natural heart. Now, that's another subject. Remember, the Lord takes out the stony heart and He gives us a heart of flesh and then He writes His laws in our hearts and in our minds and He says, I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So, God reveals these things to us. He gives us a, a grand hope and expectation to live with Him and you know, and, and the closer I believe that we get to the Lord in this lifetime, uh, the less we think about the world that's around us. I know that there's got to be a certain degree of independence uh, and drive in order for people to want to go out into the world, take a job, and so that they can support their families. Because, because of the curse that got put on Adam when Adam died, he says, through the sweat of your face you'll earn your bread. It's not the sweat of your brow. Through the sweat of your face you'll earn your bread. That's still viable today. We still have to earn the bread that God so graciously does provide. We have to work. Okay. Verse uh, verse 12, he says, Now we receive not the Spirit of the world. But, uh, okay, let me talk about that just very briefly. The Spirit of the world uh, versus the Spirit of Christ. John chapter 14 tells us very plainly that the world cannot receive the Spirit of God. The, the idea that a, a church has an idea that their purpose is to go out and change the world I think is misdirected. I think what the church needs to serve as a beacon of light to those of God's people that are in the world, that they come out of the world. And we need to be letting our lights shine. He said, let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the world cannot receive the spirit of truth. Uh, never has, never will. It's only those that are born of the Spirit of God that can receive the spirit of truth. Verse 13, he says, um, Which things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but in that which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. There's a man in a state of nature. He's dead in trespasses and sins. Paul very plainly says the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> now, 
I've used this illustration before. Faith, and we know that without faith it's impossible to please God, right? Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. So if if a natural man, he doesn't have faith, how can he please God? If a natural man accepts Christ, uh, one who doesn't have faith, does that please God? I don't believe so. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So, if a person is to accept Christ, it's because they already have faith that God has implanted within them. But remember, He has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And we know that every man is not every man without exception. It's talking about those that are born of the Spirit of God. He's dealt to every man the measure of faith. God's given you the faith in order to, to, uh, to follow Him, to please Him. That's the only way. And by the way, in another place it says all men have not faith. Uh, it says pray for us that we might be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. Okay? But anyway, yeah, they may have faith, natural faith, their historical faith, but we're talking about the faith that is a fruit of the Spirit. Only, only those that are born of the Spirit of God have that faith. And I use this illustration. Uh, he says a tree is known by its fruit. Uh, a good fruit comes from what kind of tree? It comes from a good tree. The Lord says a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Uh, neither can a good, a good tree bring forth corrupt fruit. He says make the tree and its fruit good or make the tree and its fruit evil. So good fruit comes from a good tree. Now, as an illustration... Yeah, does, an, does an apple pop into midair and a tree grow in under it? Is that how it works? No, it, you're right, it doesn't. The, the tree comes first and then the apple. And by the way, you know how we know it's an apple tree? It has apples on it. Interesting, isn't it? And that's what the Lord uh, meant when He says a tree shall be known by its fruits. Uh, you'll know what kind of tree it is. So the tree comes first and then the fruit. So we're born of the Spirit of God first, then we have the, the fruit, the ninefold fruit of the Spirit, and one of those being faith. Galatians 5.22, if you want to go read them and find out what they are. So accepting Christ, brothers and sisters, I say yea and amen that we, that we need to accept Christ. But we do, we do so understanding that He has given us life in order to do so. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Uh, go read that. if you. And what that's saying is, the question is not have we accepted Christ, but has Christ accepted us? Was our name pinned? And here's the question: Was our name pinned in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world? That's what we have to do now. We've got to work, work out our uh, our calling and election. What we have to come to the the place of assurance where we where we see the uh, that we have confidence in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ that He saved us by His grace and that we belong to Him. So the question is not really at first have have you accepted Christ, but has Christ accepted you? And, and I know that's putting that's turning it upside down the way that a lot of people believe it. But I believe that's Bible. And I believe that's the way that it needs to be. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. I've got a car I'd like to sell you, Brother West. <clears throat> uh, it's a 1902 model. Uh, I'd like to have about $6 million for that. You, you accept that proposition? Well, you know, you might shake your head, you have to get out of my sight and never come across with the money because you think that proposition is foolish and no man will accept any proposition that he thinks is foolish. Even the, uh, even the mentally challenged, uh, they're not going if to... If the mentally challenged or someone thinks that any proposition is foolish to them, they're not going to accept that. Uh, for a natural man to... To come to God, he says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, first and foremost. Right? Uh, and Jesus said in another place, you will not come to me that you might have life. Why, why is that? Because they didn't have the Spirit of God in them. You will not come to me that you might have life. Um, but he says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. 
the things of the gospel are foolishness to the man that's dead in trespasses and sins. He doesn't care for them. Uh, he never has cared for them. And he never will care for them unless he's born of the Spirit of God by that life-giving voice of the Son of God, John 5, 25. The hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. That's the only way. And you know what happens when in, and in times past you thought the things of God are foolish and now you're born of the Spirit of God? You know what happens? The things you used to hate, you now love. And the things you used to love, you now hate. That's how you know. And there's another way that we can know that we've been born of the Spirit of God. He says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. <laughs> Isn't that, that's a good indicator. That's evidence that we've been born of the Spirit of God because we love the brothers and sisters in Christ. And there's some other evidences that he gives. He says, uh, whosoever loveth is born of him. He says in another place, whosoever worketh righteousness is born of him. So if you love God and you love the brethren and you, you're, you're doing what's right in the sight of God, it's an evidence that, you, love, that uh, you pass from death unto life. And you know what? The, the new birth, brothers and sisters, is like a resurrection. Did you realize that? It's from death and trespasses and sins to a life in Christ. Now that we're born again, we have two natures. Two natures, and that's here. Uh, we know and understand that Jesus Christ finished the work that God gave him to do. The warfare is accomplished. We're, uh, he says we're to speak comfortably to Jerusalem to tell her that her warfare is accomplished. Jesus has secured eternal salvation for you. Your name was penned in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world. He died for you. You belong to Him. He's coming back to get you. But now in the meantime, you've got these two natures to deal with. And here's the war that we have to fight. It's to, to, to pray and to press into this book and seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and find out what it is that God wants us to do and how that we can bring our flesh into subjection and bring it under control. I ran across somebody again the other day. Uh, well, I'm a Christian and uh, I don't sin. Oh, here we go again. So, I'm looking for a different approach. You know, we know that sin is condemned in the flesh. But Paul says, when I would do good, evil is present with me. Alright? Uh, so, there's that text that says that if you're without chastisement, whereof all are partakers in you are bastards and not sons. All are partakers of the chastisement of God. All of God's... All of God's people are partakers of chastisement. Chastisement would be on account of what? Being perfectly sinless and holy? No. He says that He chastens us that we might be partakers of His holiness. So if someone tells you that they've not sinned, they're saying that they have no need of chastisement. And if you follow the logic, it means that they're a bastard and not a son. He said in one place, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, am I gloating that I'm a sinner? Absolutely not. Do I take pleasure in the fact that I sin against God? Absolutely not. I loathe my, the, the sin that I commit against God. I loathe it. And I mourn on account of it. But remember He said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Why do I mourn? Because my sin violates God's just and holy laws it's, that says the soul that sinneth this shall die and that the wages of sin is death. And by, there's, by the way, there's another one. They said, uh, I don't sin. Well, why you got gray hair? Why did you buy that, uh, that funeral plot that you, know, you bought over there in Greenwood or wherever it's at? If you don't sin, you're not going to die. Okay, but the fact of the matter is sin is condemned in the flesh. We're waiting for, the Apostle Paul says, to wit the redemption of our bodies until these bodies will be changed. The Lord has uh, he's redeemed us, body, soul, and spirit, and, and now we've been born again. We have the Spirit of God. What we're waiting for now is for these bodies to be changed and fashioned like unto His glorious body. That's He says we're being conformed to the image of Christ. 
Uh, Romans chapter 8, you go over there and read it. It's a being pra- uh, let me go. Yeah, let me go read that. How long has it been since we've been in Romans chapter 8? It's, it's been a couple of days. I think that it has. You know, and some and some people will try to scare you away. Oh, don't you don't you read Romans eight? That's just too deep. You don't understand that. Well, they're prejudiced against it. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. What's scary about that? It, did you notice though that it did not say what God foreknew? That's the way everybody teaches that to try to scare you about it. To try to say that God predestined sin. No, no way, no how. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Did you know that your your uh, arriving here at church was predestinated by you? I'm not saying by God, by you. You determined beforehand that you were going to come to the meeting house today. That's predestination. Well, God determined before the world began that He's going to take this people and give them to His Son, and His Son would die for them, redeem them, and they would live with Him in glory. That's not difficult, is it? Some say, well, that's unfair that God didn't choose others. Well, God was no, under no obligation to choose anybody. I, I, uh, I don't struggle where it says... Uh, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. I don't struggle with, well, why did God hate Esau? I don't struggle with that. My struggle is, why did God love Jacob? Because knowing that uh, the fact that I'm a sinner and, and that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, why does God love any of us? That's the struggle that I have. But you know what? You think about that, that magnifies the greatness and the magnitude of God's love. Even when we were dead in sins, He loved us. Even when we were His enemies, He died for us. Okay, so for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Did you know at one time that man was in the image and likeness of God? But Adam Adam was made in, in the... He, Genesis 1.26 says, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Now who is he talking to? The other two members of the Trinity. Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And he did, but he fell. Now we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. And then First John he says, It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we see Him we shall be like Him and will be satisfied. So we're being conformed to the image of Christ. And brothers and sisters, we are joint heirs. <clears throat> joint heirs with Christ. Didn't say equal heirs, but joint heirs with Christ. Everything that Christ will have will be ours. Now, remember, the Lord reveals these things to us by the Spirit. We don't, we don't have a... Well, He says, now we see through a glass darkly. But then, we'll be able to see Him face to face in that day. But I, I want you to understand that heaven is a real place. It's a place of substance. He says, in heaven you have a better and more enduring substance in heaven. Heaven is a place of substance. It's a place where there'll be real bodies, uh, but they're going to be. But our bodies are going to be changed. They're going to be fashioned like unto the glorious body of Christ, because that's what we've been predestined to—to uh, uh, to live in heaven and to be like Christ without sin. But anyway, there's a lot more that can be said about all this. I know I've been scattered. I know I've been all over the place. But you were dead in trespasses and sins. Thank. Thank God. Uh, I'm thankful that that uh, we were embraced in that covenant of grace before the foundation of the world. And that God pinned our names in the Lamb's book of life. And that He came and He suffered, bled, and died for us. He rose again for our justification. And He's coming back to get us. And when He does, we're going to be changed and we'll be able to serve God in sinless perfection. But until then, we've got to, we've got to keep our... Uh, face in this book. We've got to keep praying and pray for the grace and the strength to keep our bodies under to His honor, glory, and praise. I thank you all for your good attention. As we stand and sing a suitable song, if there's one or more has a desire to out with this body, this will be your opportunity.
Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.